you you sort of changed gears. You were pretty far along in sort of the advertising world. Yeah, I was a graphic designer. I became I was a creative director at a at a new media firm, you know, and and doing a lot of that kind of stuff and for for a while. Um, but yeah, so the the national sort of started performing and and you know doing these little tours. But while we all basically everybody in the band had had kind of careers, you know, right. actual relatively serious careers. Yeah. Well, I wonder if you start there and you have a foot in sort of this professional, normal world, uh -huh. and then you switch gears and you're in a band, is there some anxiety of like, oh, I don't belong in this world, or are people going to think I'm, I didn't, like, did you have to sort of get over that idea of people who know me in that other world are now supposed to buy me as, as this front man guy, or? Well, I mean, nobody knew me in the, <laughs> there's a funny thing, I always, there is a, a famous graphic designer is kind of an oxymoron, <laughs> right. you know, it's like there's, um, but at your early shows, I'm sure there's like other employees from the new media. Yeah, well, firm. The, our first few shows, that was how we like. I, I think we tricked people into think we that, that we had something going on as a band. Our first few shows, because we, I would have all the people that at my firm, co you know, at the company, right. fill the Mercury Lounge, and uh, and it would make people give them the impression that we were something that something was going on with our band when really nothing was for for a while, but. I was in a band in college, and, and um, which I just was kind of, which was like a Guided by Voices pavement sort of a band called Nancy, and Scott was in that band, and we played like a couple of college parties, and one we rented at a Greek restaurant when we were seniors after graduation, and had a, and that was all we ever did. And we made one little record, um, and uh, but then Scott and I moved to New York, and and it was it was probably uh, it was probably another at least four, maybe five years of, of getting on our feet in New York in these jobs and careers. And, and music kind of, it was something that I absorbed. I went to other music right up the street from where I worked like every day and bought, you know, bought a record or two a day, I think, for a while. And then that's when The National was just starting to like re get together and, 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 and do little rehearsals and stuff. And mostly we were doing it in, because I had a loft. I lived in an unconverted loft in Brooklyn that was, you know, no heat. It was, it was rats. It was terrible. But it, we had a lot of space, and 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 uh, I asked Scott to come over and like, why not start to let's write some songs again? And then he called his brother, and his brother called Aaron and Bryce Desner, and so that was around ninety nine or, or ninety nine or two thousand, and that's right when the Strokes are, are kind of are, are happening. And I was seeing the Strokes at Mercury Lounge and Don Hills and these little places, and. Uh, Seeing those bands, it made me really hungry and miss it. Did you feel young, or did you feel no, like... No, I felt like... I, we, we were well aware, like, when, when the Nationals first started doing some gigs, you know, we, it took us forever to get a gig at Mercury Lounge, you know, and um, and then when we finally did, it was, you know, the, the 6 p.m., you know, f, you know slot. And uh, the National, for the first few years, was was hyper, like, maybe too aware of not being the cool band. You know, or not being one of the cool bands. Interpol uh, rehearsed right next to us in a rehearsal space in um, in Brooklyn, and uh, and we could hear them through the wall. And 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 I remember thinking one day, like like, oh, this is this is a really great creative place. This is like that band sounds pretty good next to us, and uh, and so we felt all like 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 this is great. This is this is we're we're kind of we're in this we're in in the world, and we're we're gonna we're gonna work our asses off. Literally the next day or a couple of days later, we were going in the practice space, and they're doing a photo shoot for Spin magazine in the hallway, and we're like, uh, and I'm just looking so cool in their suits and everything, and and it was it was still probably two or three years before anybody took a picture of us, you know, at that right, point. Right. So if there was a long early phase of loving the, the songs we were making, and, and we were just figuring out what kind of band to be at that point, but we were having so much fun doing it, but we were very aware of like, all right, we can't, we're not really in the game the way those guys are. We're just not as cool. I mean, we just, we, we didn't feel as cool. Um, and so for us, it was just, we just loved, we, we kept going back, we loved the songs we were writing, and we developed, we kind of developed in the shadows, and I think we kind of got, we got lucky that nobody took our picture for a while, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, yeah. we got to be kind of a shitty band, not a shitty band, but we got to find, we got to be a band, we got to get through some of our, the, the most awkward growing pains, kind of in the shadows, where nobody was really watching, uh, and nobody was expecting much.
To continue the off-camera experience, visit offcamera.com. Get full access to additional content, podcasts, and the off-camera magazine. Because the best conversations happen off-camera.